I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video is about the second coming of Christ. Over the centuries, Christian leaders often thought Christ was returning in their time, but were disappointed. Nevertheless, Christ's promise that he will come again will one day be fulfilled. First, a story from some earlier days in my life. Having done well in business with his gifted analytical skills, Cousin Les retired early to concentrate on the things of God. He was a great help to young people like myself in the 1960s and 1970s, encouraging us to live out our faith. He also had a great passion for scripture, including its use of numbers and timelines. According to his calculations, it appeared to him that Christ might return in 1988. This would mean that the Antichrist, called the Beast in Revelation chapter 13, would become world ruler a few years earlier in 1984. Half in fun and half seriously, Cousin Les concluded, the Beast will roar in 84. Cousin Les was not the first to predict this. In the 1500s, Martin Luther thought the papacy was Antichrist. Several centuries later, people thought Napoleon was the Antichrist. Then Hitler was identified with the Antichrist. In fact, corrupt and brutal rulers over the centuries have often shown characteristics of the Antichrist who is predicted to come just before Christ returns. But something special was happening in the late 1970s. The European Economic Community, initially six nations in 1957, added three more in 1973 and a fourth in 1981, bringing the number to 10. This reminded many believers of the 10 horned beast of Revelation chapters 13 and 17. So here you can see the initial 10 nations in 1981. And the verse from Revelation 13, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns with 10 crowns on its horns. In other words, 10 nations. And here's the, it was, the treaty was signed in Rome, a city built on seven hills. Here's a map showing the seven hills of Rome. And the verse from Revelation 19, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had 10 horns, 10 nations, and seven heads. And the seven heads, it says in Revelation 17, are seven hills. And there they are. So we can see how in the 1970s, the European economic community looked very much like the ten-horned, seven-headed beast of Revelation. This coincidence, however, didn't last long, as many more countries soon joined. Cousin Les, for his part, lived to a ripe old age, long enough to see his prediction proven wrong, but still longing for Christ's return. The New Testament refers to the second coming 100 times, using words such as coming, appearance, presence, revelation, day, or hope. Many of these references emphasize its immediacy. Jesus will come and will not delay, Hebrews 10. His coming is near, James 5. He is coming soon, Revelation 22. The first Christians expected Christ's return in their lifetime. They had been warned, however, that, quote, it was not for you to know the times or dates the Father had set by his own authority, in Acts chapter 1. And Jesus himself had said, quote, no one knows about that day or hour. And in fact, here we are 2,000 years later and Christ still hasn't returned. So we must hold in tension the truth that although Christ's second coming may still be imminent, that is, it could happen at any time, its exact date is also a secret. Charles Spurgeon was an outstanding pastor in London, England from 1854 to 1892. He preached weekly to 5,000 people or more. His live preaching and his sermons that are still read today were so welcomed by Christians of many denominations that Spurgeon became known as the Prince of Preachers. Here's a picture of him. Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon's practical exhortations included many aspects of the Christian life, such as actively engaging with the poor people in London. But he also focused on important Christian truths, 
Several years before he died, he preached a sermon titled, Watching for Christ's Coming. It had three simple points. First, the Lord will come again. Second, the Lord calls us to watch for him. And third, there is a reward for watchers. It's still worth reading today. In the rest of this essay, I'll give five points why we should not only watch, but also long for Christ's return. First point, we long for Christ's return so that we will be transformed into his image. If you're still young, you may not appreciate this, but those of us in our senior years know only too well that our bodies are decaying. The whole creation has been groaning, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, and we ourselves groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's in Romans 8. And when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, who would have remembered how he supported himself in tent making, Paul put it this way, while we are in this tent, i.e. our bodies, we groan and are burdened, so we wish to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. That's in 2 Corinthians 5. When Christ returns, we get a new body like Christ. As Paul again said, we eagerly await a Savior who will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like Christ's glorious body. This is a great thing for sick or aging believers to look forward to, actually for all of us. Second point, we long for Christ's return to bring a final end to injustice. Those of us who are concerned about social justice are often frustrated to see how difficult it is to achieve. It's easy to get discouraged. Quote, the whole creation groans as in the pains of childbirth, Paul said to the Romans. They were suffering under the unrighteous reign of the Caesars. Is there social injustice? James warns us, that's the Apostle James, warns us that, quote, the judge is standing at the door. That's James chapter 5. If you're concerned about social justice, reflect for a moment on how the Apostle Paul was treated. As he went from town to town preaching the good news of Christ and distributing food to the poor, he was continually opposed, persecuted, stoned almost to death, and often going to bed without food and drink. So no wonder at the end of his life, Paul was longing for, quote, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Third point, we long for Christ's return so that we can be in his presence. Life wasn't easy for the first Christians living under the constant presence of the pagan Roman administrators who were always trying to get them conformed to the cult of Caesar. So Paul reminded them that when Christ returned, they would enjoy his presence. In fact, when Christ returns, quote, we will all be forever with the Lord. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What could mean more natural than longing to be in the presence of the person you love? When I first fell in love with my wife, I longed to be in her presence. Every night when I finished my classes at the university, I would drive to her house to spend a couple of hours there. When we are deeply in love with someone, we want to be with them. Number four, we long for Christ's return to see him receive the honor he deserves. Canadians were delighted when the Toronto Raptors won an NBA championship in 2019. Our city of Toronto celebrated them with the largest parade ever. There's a photograph of the parade right here in my home city of Toronto in 2019. It's an incredible experience that, that winning that championship. If this is how we celebrate our champions today, how much more should we want to honor the champion of the ages when he appears in his glory? We can't wait to see every knee bow at the name of Jesus and every tongue confess that he is Lord. There are many scriptures that refer to this. Should we not then look forward to and want to speed his coming? as Peter argued in 2 Peter chapter 3. Number five, we long to see God's final solution for our civilization. Christ's return will bring history to an end as we know it. God will wrap everything up when, quote, he judges the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has already given proof of this by raising Christ from the dead, Acts 17. This was Paul's argument in his talk to the Greek philosophers in Athens. Christ's return will bring unity to the disparate parts of human relationships, civilization, and culture. 
This is how Paul expressed it in Ephesians. God's ultimate purpose, which will put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, the ultimate goal of physicists, their ultimate goal is a unified field theory, one single equation that incorporates all force fields in the universe, including gravity, electromagnetism, quantum field theory, and the nuclear forces. However, God already has his unified field theory, his sure plan of unifying everything under Christ, as it says in Ephesians 1. What a day that will be. When I first heard the song, I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me, I was startled, but soon delighted at how creative, creatively it expressed what it will be like to be in Christ's presence when he returns. So there's an album cover. I can only imagine the very best of Mercy Me. It's an incredible song. Quote, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall. Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. If you're not familiar with that song, you've probably shared another experience of mine. When concluding a worship service with the hymn, How Great Thou Art, the whole congregation spontaneously stands up as we start the final verse. Quote, when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. So what a day that will be, I can only imagine. If only our eyes were more open to see what awaits us and what awaits this poor world, will we not all be longing for his coming? Thank you.